Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, for that great plan of redemption, which you initiated, you orchestrated, you are weaving together in all of human history. We long for the consummation of these things, and we wait on you and trust you with the details as you are working all of it out. We pray as we come to your word this morning that you would be glorified, that you would provoke worship in us, even for the things that you have not yet done, but which are inevitable. And we thank you for your rock-solid promises, for your sovereign power, for your meticulous care of every detail in the past, in the present, and in the future. We ask for help to look at your word this morning and to understand it and to benefit from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 12. If you have ever been near the ocean, you may have observed the effects of tide change. The ocean flows away from the land and the ocean flows back toward the land. Technically, I suppose the moon's gravity is pulling the earth away from the ocean. Maybe you've been to Rocky Point and seen the tidal flats there in Mexico. Maybe you've seen those narrow inlets to the intercoastal waterways on the Gulf Coast, the Atlantic Coast, the United States, where all of that tidal flow has to go through narrow channels. I've watched surfers surf the tidal bores in the great rivers. The tide comes in and goes up the Amazon River or goes up the Hingtang River in China. And for much of history, ships had to wait on the change of tides in order to travel the world's estuaries to get out to the ocean. The, the British merchant fleet would wade in the River Thames until the tide was going out for them to get downriver and go out into the ocean. And they had the time their arrival just right as the tides came in. You couldn't make progress against the tide. It's this insurmountable mass of water moving in one direction. We talk about the tides turning as a metaphor when we talk about the great wars of human history where the carnage and destruction unleashed by an unstoppable army is brought to a halt and then turned around. The momentum shifts, the initiative is taken by the opposing force and the battle goes the other way. And we say, the tide has turned. In the American Revolutionary War, it was the Battle of Saratoga. In the Napoleonic Wars, it was Waterloo. and the Civil War, Gettysburg. In World War I, it was the breaking of the Hindenburg Line after much effort. In Europe in World War II, perhaps the D-Day invasion turned the tide, and, and in the Pacific, it was the Battle of Midway. These battles have become famous as the markers of sea change in warfare. The tides turn, the momentum shifts, the ultimate victory is now all but assured. And in the passage before us this morning, we see the greatest reversal in world history. Here in Revelation chapter 12, the tides turn. And we've been tracing over the last couple of weeks the long ages career of Satan, who he is, what he does. We've looked at his war against God, primarily carrying out his evil plots against God's image bearers on the earth, his war against humanity. His Warfare against God's image bearers is about as old as humanity itself. Ever since the fall, Satan has had access to the earth. But as we will see in this text, and perhaps surprisingly, Satan has also had access to heaven, the very throne room of God. We will see in this text that Satan has for human history and has presently access to headquarters. The enemy is, is right there in God's planning room. It's like hosting Hitler at Churchill's war room bunkers, or Nikita Khrushchev in the White House, or Saddam Hussein at the Pentagon. The arch enemy has been allowed to stand and to stroll and even to speak in holy heaven. And he still has this access today. 
In fact, he has done this for so long that it seems the normal way of things. Since the fall of man in Genesis 3, humanity hasn't known a universe without it. Satan prowling and devouring on the earth and then slivering into the halls of heaven to rail against God's character, to rail against God's people. Revelation 12 depicts a future event that marks the turning of the tide. The ocean waters have only gone one direction for so long, we might assume that's just the way the water flows, but not so. The great reversal will soon take place, and that turn of the tide will usher in a brand new way of things for heaven and for the earth and for all who dwell in them. Let's read together our text, Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no place found for them in heaven any longer. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their witness, and they did not love their life even to death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. What we see in this text is a future war in heaven. Something new, something that has not happened yet. There, there has been an unceasing war on the earth ever since Genesis 3. The earth has been the battlefield. But Revelation 12 shows us a future time when the fight will break out at headquarters. We're going to observe this morning two results of the war in heaven. The first is Satan's expulsion, and the second is heaven's exaltation. Satan gets kicked out, heaven is happy. Those are the results of the war. Look down at verse 7. There was war in heaven. This describes an end time event. In fact, it, it sort of happens uh, between or as a, a backstory to verse 6, which is picked up in verse 14. Look back at verse 6. Last week we read that the woman, that is Israel, fled into the wilderness and had a place prepared by God so that there she, she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And look down at verse 14, which describes that fleeing the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So verse 6 and verse 14 describe for us the same event. Israel, the nation, fleeing from Jerusalem into the wilderness, protected by God from Satan's attacks and for a specific time period, 1,260 days or three and a half time periods or three and a half years. It's the same amount of time. That's the period of the great tribulation. And what happens just prior to the great tribulation, bracketed by these two descriptions of the woman fleeing into the wilderness, is the backing up to tell us this future war in heaven that sets up the persecution of Israel during the great tribulation. In fact, what we read here in verses 7 to 12 sets up or sets in motion Israel's flight. In verse 7, we read, there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. We come across this name. There are only two named angels in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. We could assume that they all have names. We're just not told what they are. Here, a named angel, Michael, takes the initiative. He is called in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13, a chief prince. That tells us something about the angelic hosts, the, the armies of angels that are at God's disposal. They have ranks. There are chiefs and not chiefs, and, and there is more than one chief. Michael is said to be one of the chiefs. 
He is also said in Daniel 10, 21 to be Israel's prince. So something of a, a ranking as a prince among angels and something of a role. His task is to give care and concern and protection and spiritual warfare on behalf of the nation of Israel. And the timing of it is given to us also in the book of Daniel. In Daniel 12, verse 1, Michael's protection of Israel in her fleeing to the wilderness during the great tribulation is described. Michael is named there in Daniel chapter 10 and chapter 12. He's also named here in Revelation chapter 12, describing the same time period. What Revelation 12 gives us is Michael's activities just before defending Israel during the great tribulation from Satan's wrath. It seems that Michael's orders from heaven's headquarters are the defense of the Jewish nation, particularly in the time of their great trouble. At the time that Daniel describes in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, as the worst period of human history ever. There's never been anything like it. Jesus similarly said in Matthew 24, there's never been a time like it and there never will be a time like it. It is the worst period of human history. Nothing that's happened in human history matches what's described here. This is still a future event. This also gives us a window into angels a little bit. We learn from Hebrews 1.14 that by definition, angels are ministering spirits that are sent by God to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Angels are not the highest rank of created beings. Humans are. Image bearers of God are a higher rank in God's created order than angels. Angels are sent to serve humans, particularly elect humans, those who will inherit salvation. So we see that angels are servants from God to serve God's purposes on behalf of God's people. They have various strengths and ranks, various responsibilities. I think you can make a case for angels even governing various regions. And Jude 9 tells us that Michael is by title an archangel. Uh, that's set apart from other angels, again, a designation of rank, and probably a designation of, of purpose and hierarchy. These ranks and various strengths and responsibilities seem to be true as well of fallen angels. Satan is the chief fallen angel. And the Apostle Paul describes for us this invisible warfare that happens as being principalities and powers in the dark realm. And there seem to be ranks and varieties of demons, as there are ranks and varieties of angels. And we read in this text that Michael and his angels wage war with the dragon. And then in response to Michael's initiation, the dragon and his angels wage war with them in return. I want you to turn to Jude chapter 9. That's one book before Revelation. Only one chapter it's small, but it's easy to find if you just go backwards from Revelation. And the ninth verse of the book of Jude says this. But Michael the archangel, when he, disputing with the devil, was arguing about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. There we get another window into Michael. He is named there. He is called the archangel, and he is in a dispute historically with Satan. So this is not the first time that Satan and Michael face off, as it were. But notice in Jude 9, this is really interesting. We, we have the humility and strength of this archangel. Michael is apparently strong enough to take him. We're going to discover that right here in Revelation chapter 12. But he doesn't take matters into his own hands historically with Satan. He doesn't pre-fight the fight. He is at God's behest. He awaits God's timing and God's purpose to do business with this arch enemy. There's a lesson for us in that. God has many enemies. God's enemies may make themselves enemies of you, Christian. And 
we may wish at times to take matters into our own hands. But a far holier and a far stronger, a far more able, a far closer to the throne room of God being, like Michael, waits. There's a lesson for us in there. We can wait on God's timing for the overthrow of his enemies. And God's enemies offend God infinitely more than they offend us. And they truly are no threat to God. And in the end, they are no threat to us either. In fact, one of the great lessons we learn from Romans chapter 8, that God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. What is that good? Your Christ-likeness in glory, Romans 8, 29. That God can sovereignly orchestrate even through the means of the tools which are his enemies and your enemies. He can exact your good and his glory. And listen, that is supreme power when you can make your enemies do your bidding. And that is exactly what God does for his children on our behalf, even through Satan. So we can wait on God's timing for the overthrow of enemies, even as Michael does here. And look at verse 8. The dragon and his angels waged war following the initiation of Michael and his angels waging war. And they were not strong enough. <clears throat> and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. They were not strong enough. We, we think of Satan as perhaps from our mythology, like the best angel, the strongest angel, the beautifulest angel. Uh, some of that is precisely that. It's a mythology built around some... Medieval poetry and other things. But his strength is less than Michael's, apparently. In fact, if you fast forward the story a little bit to Revelation chapter 20, we have an unnamed angel strong arming the strong man. Chapter 20, verse 1 says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Cuffed him and stuffed him. Locked him up. Just picked him up and put him in a hole and covered the opening. Piece of cake. For Michael to defeat Satan in this heavenly war just means that Satan's a creature. He is not omnipotent. He is malevolent. He is malicious. He is evil in his intents, but he is always on a short leash. He can't do any more than God allows. And, and all it takes is an unnamed angel to lock him up that easy. And all it takes here is Michael, a creature no doubt a, a high-ranking angel, but, but a creature nonetheless. It's, it's not Jesus here who defeats Satan and kicks him out. It, it's a mere creature, a finite being. And he takes him. Doesn't Satan know that he is already defeated? Doesn't Satan know that the end is sure? Do you, do you ever wonder about that? I mean, does, does he really think he can win? The universe is not a, a yin-yang with opposing forces of good and evil that sort of balance each other out like the good side and the dark side of the force or something like that. Uh, with the outcome in jeopardy, we don't know which one is going to win or, or maybe they both need to be together all the time to make things turn out right. Uh, that's a lie from Satan. There's no cosmic tension where the outcome is uncertain. God is always king. He is sovereign, and he gets what he wants out of his created order every single moment. And we just have to trust that it's in God's purposes for evil to exist, for Satan to roam and devour and deceive, and to do some other things we'll talk about this morning. But God's sovereignty extends over all of it. That sovereignty will manifest itself in his Messiah's rule on the earth. That's coming. And surely Satan is aware of what you and I can read in our Bibles. Do you ever wonder if he, he sits around alone on a hill somewhere with a, with a Bible open going, okay, how does the, what, what happens next? 
I think Satan's activities here are irrational, blinding rage against God and his people. He, he operates in spite and malevolence and hate and murder. He knows he's going down. And so I think he schemes to take as many with him as he can. But maybe, just maybe, Satan thinks he can win. I don't know if your mind ever goes down this road. But if you think about his history and his successes in the various skirmishes of history, maybe you'd be tempted to think, maybe he'd be tempted to think, there's a chance. I mean, Judas betrayed Jesus. And he was secretive enough that none of the disciples knew it was Judas that had given him up. You think every time there's an apostate, an apostate is one who professes Christ but was not born again, is comfortable in Christian circles for a while, but then walks away. They have not lost a salvation that they had, but they thought they had a salvation and went along with a Christian crowd for a while and then walked away. They are unpaid for by the blood of the lamb. They are unredeemed, but they were posers. And maybe Satan takes a little pride in everybody who was in church at one point that walks away eventually. Everyone that boldly proclaims the gospel in a short span and then forgets the gospel later. So John the Apostle had to write to, to his churches and explain to them the phenomenon of the apostate. They went out from us. They were never of us. They went out from us to demonstrate they were never of us because if they had stayed with us, they would have. Could you imagine being troubled by people who walk away from the faith? I've been troubled by that. Satan must gleefully rejoice when people reject Christ, the ex-evangelical movement on social media in our day, must be a party for Satan. Is that a tease for him? See, people walk away from Christ. I'm going to keep doing it. Every time gospel seed is snatched away, you remember the parable Jesus told about the soils? Some of the gospel seed that is broadcast to everyone that will listen falls in tough places. And Satan is the one who is said by Jesus to come and snatch away those gospel seeds. Maybe he thinks he's winning when he does that. Satan is given credit by Jesus for sowing tares in the field of the world. The field is where the, the wheat grows. There is to be a harvest at the end of the age. But look, an enemy sowed tares. They are noxious weeds that get in the way and they look just like the weed. And you, you have a hard time pulling them out because wheat and tares look the same. And, but man, you can't eat those. They're, they're poisonous. They're harmful. They choke out the real wheat. Who did that? Satan Satan did that. Does he glory in it? Does he, does he think he's making progress? Does Satan think he's making progress when elders are snared? 1 Timothy 3.6 says, uh, don't let any be, anybody become a pastor in a church who's a brand new convert, lest he fall into the snare of the devil. Does Satan rejoice when leaders fall? Satan rejoiced when widows are distracted. In 1 Timothy 5.15, we discover that Satan is active in the women's ministry at Ephesus, having gotten some women distracted following after him. Whatever his schemes are, he's involved in the church. I think Satan must rejoice when false teachers are commissioned. 2 Timothy 2.26 describes those false teachers as having been tricked in the brain to go after doing Satan's will. They're enslaved. They're, they're in bondage as his cohorts, as his robots to do what he wants them to do. I mean, he must be thinking he's gaining footholds even in the church. And we learn in Ephesians 4, 27, that, that when believers are unforgiving, when they have anger towards one another, it is a, a fissure, a crack that Satan takes opportunity. Satan probably loves it when we do this. Listen, Satan's got the whole world deceived, as we read in this text. He's the deceiver of the whole inhabited earth. 
He has hidden the gospel, blinding it from the minds of unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Satan has been active in snuffing out the witnesses of Jesus. Through the, through the Jews and then through the Roman Empire and the persecutions and, and then through an institution that called itself the church, Satan was actively putting to death martyrs, people who believed in the gospel. Listen, the kingdoms of the world are in his grip, such that the New Testament calls him the God of this world. We talked about this last week in Genesis 6. Satan tampered with the human race at the genetic level, which led to a worldwide destruction and the eradication of the entire human race, save eight people. Did he think he was winning? He nearly exterminated the entire Jewish line on several occasions, the Davidic line on several occasions. When he couldn't snuff David out, he incited David to sin and then incur God's judgment against the nation. And in the last days, Satan will unify the whole world in a unified religion to worship his proxy, the Antichrist, as if that man were Jesus on the earth. This seems like success after success after success. A blitzkrieg across Europe that seems unstoppable. Will the tides turn? Do these successes give him hope? It certainly seems to us sometimes like Satan is winning. But here in Revelation 12, the tide turns. It was, of course, never in doubt in God's plan, though we might wonder, and maybe Satan may hope. And this skirmish breaks out in heaven. Satan loses. And, and this loss is anti-dramatic. Read it again in verse 7. Michael and his angels wage war with the dragon. The dragon wages war and they were not strong enough. No longer a place found in heaven. Listen, I, I want the details. <laughs> I want the buildup of the tension. I want to see the back and forth. I want to see the thrust and the parry, the blow and the counter blow. But there's no tension here. And there's no tension because there's no uncertainty. Just the inevitable outcome. Satan defeated by a creature, and then expelled. That's it. There's no longer a place in heaven. Now the implication, and you got to pay attention to this detail here, in verse 8, there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Notice the detail, no longer. The implication of that is, well, up until this point, there is a place and notice another detail in this verse, found for them. Found for them. Satan and the demons, until the future date of Revelation 12, until this war that ushers in Messiah's kingdom right on its heels, they have access to heaven. This is a present and ongoing activity of Satan and demons. Turn to the Old Testament to Job and Job chapter 1. The book of Job is not a moral story. It's not a, a, a fictional tale to teach a lesson. The book of Job is history. And most of the history we get in the Bible is the history we could see on the earth. We don't often get the behind the scenes that's going on. But here the curtain is drawn back. And we see behind the scenes that, that two worlds are interacting with one another. And, and sometimes these worlds converge in a visible and tangible way. Read with me in verse 6. Now it was the day that the sons of God came to stand before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them. Sons of God, a reference to angels, Satan, one of them. And Yahweh said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Sounds like 1 Peter. Roaring lion, roaming, devouring. Then Yahweh said to Satan, have you set your heart upon my servant Job, 
Some translations read, have you considered him? See, God knows Satan's malevolence before Satan states it. And God puts out for Satan a potential trophy. You think you can destroy a life that I have made my own by my love? Try Job. Of course, Job doesn't see this going on. There's none like him on the earth, God says, a blameless and upright man. He fears God. He turns away from evil. And Satan answered Yahweh. And you hear the malevolence and the audacity, the brazen challenge and libel to God's character. Does Job fear God without a cause? Haven't you made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has? Job is hashtag blessed. And that's why he lives the life that you love. Send forth your hand now, touch all that he has. He'll surely curse you to, his fa- to your face. And Yahweh said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Just don't set forth your hand toward him. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh. If Satan is going to have this conversation in God's throne room about me, I kind of don't want to know about it. Job didn't know about it. We're reading about it. And it's a stunning scene. God is being accused of bribery. And Job is being accused of being bribed. He's not really loyal to Yahweh. He'll turn in a second if you take his stuff away. And what does the whole narrative of the book of Job prove? No, can't undo what God does in heart. That's the theme. There's a lot of convoluted conversations until we understand all of that. Satan's wicked. He's willing to attack God's people. And in doing that, he's attacking God himself. That's what's going down here. Look down at Job 2. Verse 1. Again, it was the day that the sons of God came to stand before Yahweh, Satan also among them, to stand himself before Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Satan, where do you come from? Satan answered, from roaming about on the earth and walking around. He's still about the same business. Then Yahweh said to Satan, have you set your heart upon my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. What happened in the meantime? Satan did what God allowed and took Job's stuff. He brought indescribable suffering into his life. And it didn't work. He holds fast his integrity. You incited me against him to swallow him up in vain, to nothing, to emptiness. Satan answered Yahweh and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he'll give for his life. Send forth your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, now he'll curse you to his face. Behold, Satan, he's in your hand. Just spare his life. And then you get Job afflicted with physical maladies, painful things. And in all this, Job didn't sin. Not that Job was sinless. You can read the record of the things he thought that were wrong and the things he did that were in error. But in the matter that Satan addressed, Job worshiped Yahweh. Why? Because Satan, with all of his skills... With all of his power, with the leash let out by God, could not undo the supernatural work of God and the security it brings in the heart of someone who loves him. Satan couldn't beat God in the heart of a man. For all of human history, Satan has been up to these kinds of schemes And it's only the last three and a half years of human's history that he is kicked out of heaven. And that's a short time. He'll spend a thousand years then in jail, and then he'll spend eternity in the lake of fire. But for now, in Revelation 12, following this war with Michael, Satan is excluded from heaven. No longer allowed. This future event will mean a three and a half year expulsion 
and never to return. Finally, in this scene, God is done with Satan's presence in heaven. He has been a tool. He has been on a leash. But that leash has included the ability to prowl about the earth and devour and access the very throne room of God in heaven. Now look at verse 9. Four times here we see the, the verb thrown down in verses 9 and 10. The great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And then in verse 10, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He's not just asked to leave. He doesn't just take his defeat and, and skulk away. He is ignominiously tossed like a drunkard who didn't play, pay his bar tab, thrown out into the street, thrown out of the place. And not just Satan, but all the demons too. This is, as one scholar has written, the purging of heaven. And this is an interesting glimpse into the reality of things. We talked the last couple of weeks about the fact that the world is not as it seems. Behind the scenes, there are powers and principalities, activities in the heavenly realms that have real and tangible effects on the earth. The invisible causes of the things we experience, divine causes and evil, malevolent causes. And of course, Satan is described here, named. He is the great dragon, the symbol of Satan that we were introduced to in the beginning of Revelation 12. He is called here the serpent of old. This clearly identifies him with the, the archvillain in Genesis 3. He is called Diabolos, the devil, the slanderer. He slanders God and he slanders the image bearers of God. And he is called Satan, which means enemy or adversary. And then we get this description. He is also the deceiver of the whole world. It's an apt description. Satan has for millennia deceived the world. But you know, he has never deceived heaven. The word for world here is not the word for, word for universe. It is the word for the inhabited earth. And that just means heaven's never been tricked. The truth is too big for the lie. The truth outlives the lie. The truth eventually expels the lie. And Satan's exit here is a forced exit, a future event brought about by the war in heaven initiated by Michael the archangel. These details are important because it locates the expulsion of Satan not at the fall of man, not at his initial rebellion, and not at the cross of Christ. Not at the resurrection of Christ or the birth of the church or, or any other events that scholars sometimes propose for the expulsion of Satan. Very clear from this text, this is a future event that happens after the war with Michael in heaven. And Daniel very clearly ties all of these events to the initiation of the great tribulation. Still future. Think about Romans 16, 20. Have you memorized this one? I, I like this one. This verse is worth memorizing. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Several things I love about that verse is, is it is future tense from Paul's perspective. Paul wrote the book of Romans some 25 years after Christ rose from the dead. The, the crushing of Satan, the, the Christus Victor theme of the Bible, isn't located time-wise at the cross of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. Although those events bring about Satan's ultimate defeat, they do not bring about the fulfillment of it. That's still yet future, even when Paul writes the book of Romans. It's still future to us. And that's so comforting. You need to know that Satan right now is not bound and he's not dead. He is a roaming, devouring lion. His wiles must be warned of. We must be aware of his schemes. We must be armored up. We need to know what he's about. Because he's active. He's active in the world and he's active in the church. It doesn't suit us to ignore his activities. But to know that the God of peace... This is a peace through superior firepower, not a kumbaya peace where Satan gets along with God. But the God of peace will soon crush him. 
That is an echo of Genesis 3.15, the fulfillment of that promise we've all been waiting for since the first generation of humanity. The woman will bear a seed that will crush the snake. And we get to the, the coming of the seed in the person of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, the birth of the church, the Holy Spirit poured out, and then the gospel going to the ends of the earth. And on the gospels spread, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Rome, ends of the earth. On the gospel's way out, we get this promise, the God of peace will soon crush Satan. You need to know that, Christian. This lion roaming the earth, seeking to devour, deceiving the whole world, blinding the minds of the unbelievers to the gospel, will be crushed. It is an inevitable reality, and it is a future reality. And I will tell you the problem with getting the theology wrong here, of thinking that right now Satan is bound, or he has already been defeated in, in a tangible way, in a fulfillment way, is problematic because he's active and then what does his crushing mean if it's already happened? But his crushing means something if it's future. And you can take comfort in it. Like you can take comfort in all of the, the promises of God. They are rock solid and meaningful. The first result of the war in heaven is Satan's expulsion. The second result of this war, found in verses 10 to 12, is heaven's exaltation. Heaven's exaltation. It, it's a party. It's a song. It's, it's a doxology. It's a call to rejoicing. Look at verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God has come. Verse 12, For this reason rejoice, O heavens. This is a call to praise. This is a, let's get together and sing about something that is incredible. This is a spontaneous announcement in heaven, a song, a doxology, and it is a, a loud voice making this for John to hear. And, and notice the content of it. Now, verse 10, the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. And the little word now there is another important detail. This is a temporal frame. In other words, it tells us when. This is not something that has already taken place in our day, nor in John's day. It is tied to the now that is described by the events in this passage, in this context. When the war in heaven takes place, when Satan is expelled, then heaven will rejoice, and they will say, kingdom's coming. Salvation's coming, final, glorious consummation, and the authority of God's Messiah will be seen. It's here. Listen, we know from Jesus that no man knows the day or the hour. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, held himself back from the knowledge of the timing. And he went on to say that not even the angels of heaven know when these things will take place. But the war in heaven and the expulsion of Satan will indicate to all who are in heaven that the time has come. Now they know. Sorry, I got my time stamp wrong. Not right this second. Not 2021. But in this text, when the war happens and Satan is expelled, they will know. Now's the time. The countdown has started this will indicate to all of them that, that they can look ahead for that short time. Look down at verse 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing, Satan even knows at this point, that he has only a short time. I don't think Satan knows until this event when all of this is going down. The angels of heaven don't know, we don't know, anybody who gives you dates for prophetic fulfillment is already off the map. But here, Satan will know his time is short. Time's up. Heaven knows and heaven rejoices. Heaven exalts in the closeness of the end. There's only three and a half years that remain in God's purposes. God's purposes for the kingdoms of rebellious humanity under the murderous rule of this adversary. It's all that's left. 
But what follows will be a, a thousand year glorious reign of Christ on the earth, followed by a new heavens and new earth for all of eternity. And so the vile presence that holy heaven has tolerated for so long is expelled. And this marks the close following of the reign of Messiah on the earth. And this gets heaven excited. There's two important theological implications here. Number one, we are not currently in the kingdom. This is not the kingdom. Some theological systems make the church the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. This world is not the kingdom. Now, we belong to the kingdom. We're sons of the kingdom. We love the king. Jesus is king in my heart. God is sovereign as the king over all things all the time in his absolute kingness. But the kingdom that the Bible promises and talks about of coming to the earth under Jesus' reign as Messiah has not taken place yet, and we're not in it now. The kingdom's arrival, according to this passage, awaits these future events. And there are practical implications for us in that. Christians sometimes talk about doing kingdom work. I guess that's okay language. But kingdom work is not the rejuvenation of the present era. That is not the task of the church. If by kingdom work we mean the population of the next era, then yes, we do kingdom work. What is kingdom work? Preach the gospel, be ambassadors of the king who went away and is coming back so that that king will have more citizens having believed the gospel when he comes. That's kingdom work. Uh, cleaning up the, the streets for Jesus. We can do that because we love people, but, but we're not in the kingdom. And, and what a shoddy kingdom this is, if this were it, frankly. The Bible's very clear about what the kingdom will look like in its prosperity, in its agriculture, in world peace in obedience from the heart, from people of every nation to Jesus on the earth, on the throne of David in Jerusalem. The Bible is unmistakably clear about what the kingdom is. And so we're, we're not in it yet. These, these events detail the future coming of that kingdom. That's why Jesus told his disciples to pray, Lord, bring your kingdom. Thy kingdom come. That's what that prayer means. There's a second important theological implication here. And it is about binding ministries. I cut my teeth on a church uh, where we bound Satan. We bound demons. Uh, we prayed for the binding of Satan. We prayed for the binding of demons. Uh, this language comes from Jesus who said, you, you can't take the strong man's stuff unless you bind up the strong man. Uh, that was not a, the, the genesis of a new ministry called binding ministry. Jesus is just talking about who's bigger and stronger. Who, who, who's the biggest guy on the block? It, it's Jesus, not Satan. But then you get to Revelation chapter 20, and we do find a binding ministry there. Turn, turn the page. In Revelation 20, we talk about this unnamed angel who's able to just get a hold of the dragon and put him in jail. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan, and bound him. See, there is a binding ministry. But the text is very specific about it. He is bound for a thousand years. What does it mean for Satan to be bound? The text tells us he's thrown into the abyss, verse 3. The abyss is shut and sealed over with the result that he would not deceive the nations any longer. What is he doing now? Just deceiving the whole inhabited earth. We just read it. His present activities are curtailed, stopped completely because he's locked in a deep hole. For how long? The thousand years. After these things, he'll be released again for a short time. Six times in the span of six verses, you get the phrase a thousand years. It's, it's very clear that there's a thousand year period, which is Messiah's reign on the earth, during which time Satan will be bound. That's really good news. The Westminster Confession talks about three enemies of the people of God, the world, the flesh, the devil. Think about those for a moment. The world will belong to Jesus. He will be the government. 
The devil will be locked up, unable to deceive the nations any longer. And the only enemy left is the human heart. Why is there a rebellion at the end that follows Satan when he's released for just a second? There's a whole other sermon about how bad the human heart is. <laughs> we'll get to that eventually. But this idea that we bind demons or bind Satan, if you've ever prayed along those lines, maybe you've wondered after you opened your eyes in prayer, wait, didn't I do that last week? Why, how did he get out? Who let him go? Where, uh, what happened to that chain? Why, who unsealed the abyss? It's almost comical when you think about us humans wanting to do what God says he will do through his angel in the future. In the meantime, Satan has things to do. Notice verse 10. What is the reason that heaven starts singing this song? Second half of the verse. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He who accuses them before God day and night. What is the stated reason for heaven? Knowing that the establishment of Messiah's kingdom is right around the corner. Because Satan can't stand here in heaven and say bad things about God's people. This is shocking. <laughs> we see here beside, behind the scenes what, what we saw in the book of Job. This is the, the ministry of Satan, if we could call it that. The, the ongoing activity of Satan. We talk about ministers in government, the prime minister. Uh, the, Satan's ministry is described here in, in heaven as an ongoing activity. It's the diabolical slander of the people of God in the very throne room of their father. God loves his children. And here's this adversary, this slanderer, standing in God's presence and saying, God, your children are awful and they've done this and this and this and this and this and I know about all of it. And he throws the sins of God's people in God's face, demanding that God's justice do something about it. You know, moms, when people insult your kids, mama bear comes out. Just multiply that by infinity. This accuser of the brethren is vile. And, and maybe you're asking the two questions that I'm asking right now. Why does God allow this? And why would God want us to know that he allows it? <laughs> Again, like Job, wouldn't it be better if we just didn't know the behind the scenes so why does God allow this? And why does God reveal this to us here? I'm just going to offer a few suggestions. Can I do that? I think we see in this ministry of Satan that the most malevolent accusations fall to the floor in God's courtroom. These fiery darts of accusation by a, an antagonistic lawyer who, who doesn't really want justice, is not interested in the, the honor of God and the, and the glory of God's holy courtroom. He just wants to throw God's work in God's face. Oh, you, you, you say you love these people. You, you, you say these people are holy. They're declared righteous. They're justified. They're adopted. They're guaranteed. You think they can't fall away? I'll tell you what they did. This is wicked work. And yet all of those malevolent accusations fail. And this highlights for us something else we need to see in this ministry of Satan. It is the advocacy of Jesus. Listen to the words of 1 John 2, 1. My little children, <laughs> tender words that we need. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The ministry of Satan highlights the ministry of Jesus, our advocate, what Hebrews describes as our perfect high priest at the right hand of God, whom Paul describes as making intercession on our behalf. The, the awful, dark, evil, malicious accusations of Satan highlight the clean, pure, 
satisfying justice, finished work of Jesus the Christ for you. And God wants you to see it. This highlights for us the truth of forensic declaration. The forensic declaration of justification. The doctrine of justification in the New Testament is the doctrine that God has declared you, Christian, to be just or right before him. At his holy bar of perfect justice, God declares that you have never done anything wrong and you've always done everything right. You've perfectly, completely, and totally met his standard. Of course, not by what you have done, not by what you have failed to do. You bombed from day one. But Jesus Christ, the righteous, is your advocate who is a propitiation of God's wrath in your place. That is, he satisfied divine wrath completely and totally for you as a substitute. And the substitution stands so that when God sees you, Christian, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that your sin is removed from you as far as the east is from the west. That God does not remember your transgressions. You do. Satan does. Your spouse might. God won't. Because of the advocacy of Jesus. This increases our dependence. Listen, if you know you have an accuser before God. Oh, I need Jesus again. This helps tender consciences. Can your tender conscience out accuse Satan's accusations? Probably not. You might feel burdened by your sin, Christian. I think Satan and his malevolence can do more damage. And your tender conscience cannot outdo Christ's advocacy. If the fiery darts of Satan in God's very throne room fall to the ground to no effect, every other accuser fails too, including your own heart. And I think in this we see the will of Satan, the worst of all evil, failing at the throne of grace. He doesn't get what he wants. Because everything he tries to shoot gets absorbed in the love of God for you. It's just buried. It doesn't go anywhere. It it has no effect. Winston Churchill said there is no greater thrill in life than to be shot at without effect. I don't know if that's true. But the fiery darts go nowhere. Listen to Romans 8. In fact, turn there. Romans 8. Paul here gets at the same theme, though he's not pulled the curtain from behind the scenes on what's happening in heaven with Satan. Who will bring a charge, he says, against God's elect? And then he says, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? And these may be rhetorical questions, but we could fill in the answer to verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? The accuser of the brethren. He does it night and day, according to Revelation 12. Until the great tribulation. But then the following question, who condemns? No one. Why? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Why the need for advocacy? Because someone's standing there accusing. You got lawyers on opposite teams with you in the dock. We need to see the dark will of Satan according to God's wisdom so that we might see the the bright, unapproachable light of God's glory shining out for us in forgiveness of sin through Christ. So heaven's relieved. Now the salvation, the power of the kingdom of God. Why? Because the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. So heaven rejoices. 
For this reason, verse 12, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. If there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, I think we can start to understand why heaven is rejoicing here. Never again will the glorified redeemed or the countless angels or the four living beings who are all in heaven ever have to hear one more foul word of accusation from the vile presence of that enemy that heaven tolerated so long. It's over. He's out. And look at verse 11. And they overcame. Who's the they? The accused. A reference to us believers still on the earth or tribulation saints who will be accused night and day in the first half of the tribulation. They overcame. And throughout this chapter, John here is using past tense verbs to describe future reality. Same thing here. How will they have overcome? And he does that to assure us that it's as good as done. <clears throat> First of all, by the blood of Christ. Look at verse 11. They overcame because the blood of the lamb. <laughs> the blood of Jesus Christ meets the demands of God's justice. So no accusation can stand. They overcome. <clears throat> They may not be stronger than Satan. They're not older. They may not be smarter, but they win because Jesus. Secondly, they, they overcome because the testimony of words. Look at verse 11. And they overcome because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their witness. Perhaps the, the word which is their witness. They have professed faith in Christ. They, they believe in the blood of the Lamb and, and they say it out loud. They confess Him before men and so God confesses them before heaven and the angels. And then thirdly, because of the testimony, not just of words, but of life. Look at verse 11. And they did not love their life even to death. They put their money where their mouth is. This isn't an empty profession of faith in Christ. This is the kind of profession of faith in Christ that says, take the whole world and give me Jesus. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. I want a part of him and you can kill me if you want. That is their testimony. Uh, the word for testimony here is our common word for martyr. This is probably a reference to those who would subsequently die during the tribulation under that wrath of Satan. Look down at verse 12. Heaven's rejoicing, but woe to the earth. This is great news for heaven, bad news for the inhabited world. Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. What does this mean? Satan's been moonlighting. He's been two-timing. He's got a side hustle. He's roaming the earth, devouring, and he's accusing the brethren before the throne room of God night and day. Satan has never been omnipresent. He can only be at one place at one time. And he's back and forth. If you're a, a Marvel movie fan, you might think of the Bifrost. Uh, that is a, a mythological connection that I think has its roots in Jacob's ladder. I think there's a, a biblical precedent for thinking about angelic beings going back and forth between the seen and unseen world, and Satan no longer gets to do it. The Bifrost is broken. Jacob's ladder is, is crushed for him. He can't use it anymore, and now his full attention is to the earth. He's no longer two-timing. He doesn't have a second job, and all of his wrath is dispensed earthward. He can't accuse in heaven. He can only rampage the earth. And he is nothing like Jesus. Jesus can be at the right hand of the Father and Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is at the right hand of the, uh, of the throne on high advocating for you and he is with you in your witness to the end of the age. Jesus is omnipresent. Even while in his resurrected body, he is physically located. Satan can only be in one place at one time, and now it's only the earth. There's only one channel for all of his hate. That will unfold in the last half of the Great Tribulation. His hatred for the nation of Israel and for the rest of her children. Listen, does it trouble you that Satan can do this? That Satan does this? Night and day. Take comfort. 
Jesus is better. Jesus is bigger. Jesus is stronger. All in infinite measure. Before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your advocacy. We thank you that you win. We thank you that Satan loses. We know these events are future, but they are history in the future because you've written them. It's as good as done. We bank on these things. In our present troubles, in our tender consciences, when there are enemies about and enemies within, we look to you, Jesus, as our advocate, our great high priest, For you have loved us, you purchased us with your blood. Our lives are written in your scars, and we are yours. We love you. Amen.